everybody. I just recently got back from Sedona, Arizona, where uh, I spent New Year's with my husband. And, of course, that's a place everyone goes to get spiritual guidance, and they go for readings and that kind of stuff, which we did. We participated in a lot of that stuff, too. And, you know, we tried different, we went to different mediums and had different kinds of readings and different, you know, did all these different kinds of things done. And we, we kind of can take what works for us and leave what doesn't. We can kind of comparison shop and do it, sort of take some things with a grain of salt. So it's not like we went there and just are all into everything everybody says. And there were certain things, but certain, you know, certain people just didn't, just didn't seem to work for us at all. Well, anyways, came back and then just sort of got into this, this Leah Remini special about Scientology. And kind of got me to thinking that, well, first of all, I talked about that there were these, all these similarities between what I saw happening with Scientology and what I see happening in a narcissistic family. So it occurred to me that maybe what might serve some of my viewers would be to talk about what would be some signs and things you could look for if you wanted to be a discerning person when it comes to seeking out a spiritual teacher or a spiritual leader of some kind. You know, I don't know who who is exactly susceptible to getting caught up in cults and things like that. Certainly the younger, the more likely you would be to do it, but just I think if you have a narcissistic upbringing and you are all, uh, still all, also really young, you may need to be especially careful to keep a lookout for someone who might have ulterior motives or ego needs being met. The spiritual teacher you're looking at may not be an enlightened master after all, maybe a bit of a narcissist. So I kind of came up with five things you could look for to tell you if you were to your checks and balances and make sure that you were with someone who had your best interests at heart and was a genuine person. So that's what we're going to talk about today. No one joins a cult thinking they're joining a cult. People end up wrapped up in things. Of course, by the time with the Church of Scientology, it gets so invested because, first of all, financially, it's really expensive. And um, then your whole family's involved. So by the time you're thinking about you know, you're starting red flags are maybe starting to come up about this doesn't seem right. By then, you're thinking, I have nothing. My whole life revolves around this church. I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, and my whole family and everybody I love is involved here, is invested here too. I'm really with them all. You know, that's what you're thinking about. So, you know, very, very scary. But when I, when I kind of measured, I looked at, you know, these different qualities in people who can be leaders and be a little bit corrupt. Basically, five qualities you can look for if you are thinking about joining a church or getting involved in any kind of volunteer organization or work situation or anything like that where you think someone in a leadership position might be a little bit crooked or a little bit narcissistic. So think about in the spiritual realm, you know, in a church kind of situation, it's just the perfect environment because you've got all kinds of people that are you know, looking for answers, there's the built-in, higher than, ability to connect with God or source that they don't have, you know, that kind of thing. And especially, that's, that's actually first, that's what the first trait. If, if they're, if, if anyone is claiming to have an ability to connect on your behalf with God or the source or anything like that, and that they have this ability to do something that you can't do for yourself, that's a red flag. You know, for the most part, most legitimate spiritual practices are going to be teaching you how to do it for yourself, are going to be teaching you how to connect to your own power and that sources within you, you know, and so you don't need them. Anyone who's telling you you need them, that's a red flag. Most everything that a spiritual teacher should be teaching you is how to take learn methods of doing things to connect to source and empower yourself. That's really where all roads should lead. Okay, so number two would be they put other leaders down. They put other practices down. They put competitors down. They have to be the best. Um, number three is that they'll seek pity. And we've, we've seen this across the board. We see this in the dating arena. We see this all the time is that they'll, they will seek pity. Is putting someone more in the realm of sociopathy? Because I don't think that overt narcissists do this. I think that only covert narcissists actually do the seeking, seeking pity. Not to say that what overt narcissists definitely will do is blame others. 
So if they won't, yeah, they won't take responsibility for ever making a mistake. So maybe some people call that seeking pity because everything else is always somebody else's fault. Number four is you'll have a protected inner circle. So you'll have a, a protected sort of entourage of people that really protect him. Now, this can be true also in the narcissistic family because you'll see the other siblings protecting them, the parents enabling it, the, you know, the, the whole family system kind of works around the narcissist. And in the family system and in the religious sector, it can be that people get so identified with their beliefs that that anything else is a threat to who they believe they are. And so they can get very protective of the, of the leader of that. Of course, what's true in both of these arenas, too, is that the more they do, the more entrenched they get. Because I don't know if any of you have heard of Jay-Z Knight or Ramsa, and she is someone who claims, she lives out here, and she claims to be able to channel. And, you know, people believe it, and they run their lives around her. And Lynn Evans is like the most famous person I know that had followed it at some point. I don't know if she still does. But what I noticed was that she would come into this restaurant where I worked and always with a big group of people, a big entourage of people, a big, you know, the table of 20. And I think that that's how, how she kind of basically went around. Protected in her circle. And uh, in this Church of Scientology thing, they were talking too about how they have this big thing with celebrities in Scientology. They have a thing called the Celebrity Center. They really cater to celebrities. And so they were saying with Tom Cruise, for instance, that they just surround him with Scientologists, that they staff his whole house, um, they give him, you know, a driver, maids, and the eyes for his kids, you know, everything is Scientologist, so that he doesn't even ever have to hear any other outside information at all that he can get just reinforced all the time for being a Scientologist. And they cater to him and they take care of all of his needs. And, you know, there's insulation there. The the last one is that they teach each other from an intellectual perspective. They can talk about intellectual ideals, but they're not teaching from the heart. They're not teaching. It's not an emotional connection. They're not connecting with you on an intimate, empathic, compassionate, loving sort of way. And you'll feel that. If you're talking with someone who's giving you just lots of information, especially the metaphysical jargon. You know, that kind of just, that stuff, I have said this before, but that kind of stuff just, it can get a little too much for me. And so if I'm not getting a sense that someone is really looking into my eyes and deeply connecting with me, you know, that, I think that would resonate with me. I think I would, I would pick up on that being something wrong with that. They're going to be talking in, in an intellectual way and probably not so much sharing anecdotes of personal experiences nor do they seem to want to hear much about you and want to care much about your personal experiences in your life. That's a red flag, especially if they're kind of reading stuff off or, or yammering stuff off in a rote. You know, like it's, you know, um, this is what we say, and it's sort of like that, just sort of like, you know, without any sort of sensitivity to their audience, which is you, about who you are specifically, or wanting to get to know something about you, wanting to convey something about themselves. That's intimacy. You know, that's intimacy. There won't be intimacy. Those are five things that you can look for if you are getting yourself into a situation where you're going to be in close contact with someone in a leadership position. Probably a little bit more in a church or a volunteer setting or something like that. Something where they are possibly having the ability to play on your good nature. Because narcissists will target things like that where people, good-hearted people, will go to do something, to be helpful, you'll find narcissists there. And so if you ever, you know, want to go help out at the Boys and Girls Club or, you know, who knows what, some kind of charity, something like that, watch out for, I think that it's quite possible that you could encounter a narcissist there who's in the leadership role because, you know, they look for places like that. But definitely, but most definitely churches. If you guys have any experience with anything like this, I would love to hear about it. Tell me what, you know, if you had any experience with, Realizing, I don't, like, for instance, you know, did you, did you have any experiences where you thought that it was so normal in your family and then you got away from your family and you realized it was totally abnormal? Write, write that, write that down and tell me about that. Those are kinds of things where it seems really, you know, really cult-like. And I wish I could think of some, of some of the examples that they, that I saw on this show last night because, you know, they were talking about things that they completely thought of them as totally normal, you know, but I'm sure that they look at it now and just think, oh my gosh, what were they doing? And, you know, just as I do, and I'm sure you do too a little bit, 
about some of the things that, that you used to do, that you used to put up with, and you just almost can't believe that you did now. You know, those are really similar. There's, it's a similar thing. And, it, and like, like, you know, we grew up, you know, if you're a kid, you grew up in this situation, so, you know, what are you going to do? But, uh, that's really the case a lot of times with these cults, too, is that people do come up at, from childhood. So you really have blinders on when that's the case. So, anyway. Yeah, let me know if you have any experience with that. And please subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. Write some comments. 